Are you ready for some Jersey? Well, we've got Jersey. The zipper was made here. The light bulb was made here. The color television calls the Garden State home. Everybody wants to know about New Jersey. Sandy beaches, beautiful cities. We even have the Jersey Turnpike. Inventors, music, the movies. You need an exit? We got them too. You want Jersey? This is Jersey. Welcome to this edition of This is Jersey. Our guest today is jazz and blues singer-songwriter Sarah Partridge. Sarah is performing at a variety of exciting venues in 2016, and she's here to give us some insight on her wonderful music career. Sarah, you're known throughout the nation, your music and being a jazz artist. I mean, how'd you get started in music? Well, it's a, it's a little bit of a strange story. <laughs> I, um, I was in Los Angeles, and I was an actress and uh, out with a bunch of friends one night at the Improv in uh, Hollywood and they were doing a karaoke night. Don't laugh. And uh, my friends urged me to get up. I said, I'm not going to go up and, and, and sing some song I don't know and make a fool of myself. I had sung before. I mean, I'd done musicals. Um, so they forced me up. I got up and I found uh, an arrangement of Summertime on there and I thought that'll work for me because I loved jazz and knew jazz quite well. And next thing I knew, I'd sung the song and people were cheering and a guy came up to me and said, you know, I book jazz music. Are you a professional jazz singer? And I said, no. And that sort of was it. It started the ball rolling. But you were, you were uh, an actress at that point. Yeah, right? I was. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, doing the thing that actresses do in, in L.A. Um, and this really sort of started to turn the tide. Uh, I started doing more and more of it, enjoying it more and more, realizing that I could do it, uh, feeling more in control, actually, of my career, if there's any way of, to feel in control. Mm -hmm. in now, the did, did you have any training in music at that point? Very little. I was a theater major in college, so I'd taken some voice lessons. I had a natural sense of this and that, um, and that was really about it. And again, I performed in musicals, so I performed in front of audiences before, but it's strange that I didn't want to do musicals. I wanted to do jazz. I wanted to incorporate the improvisational part of it. So go figure. That's how it started. I understand one of your first roles with, was with Tom Cruise in Risky Business. How'd you get that role? That was my first professional job out of college. The producer, casting director came to Northwestern University where I was a theater major and they auditioned kids there. And I heard nothing, I heard nothing, then got a call back and had to go into Chicago and, and an audition in front of everybody, didn't hear anything. And those were the days almost before, uh, you know, answering machines and everything. So finally, a friend of mine said, you know, somebody keeps calling from the Shirley Hamilton agency. You got some role in some movie. Long story short, I ended up working two weeks on the film, got to know Tom and all the guys in the film. We had a wonderful time. My best, my best scene was cut. <laughs> it was one of my, it was my first screen kiss where they did a 360, you know, and I was like, oh, I was in love with the guy from the moment I met him. He was like, how you doing? So that was, that was the first job I had. And little did I know that Risky Business would become this iconic, you know, film. So how many times did you see it in the theater? I only saw it once in the theater when it first came out. And I've seen it a few times since. Um, and I've kept in touch with Tom. We've, you know, uh, in a casual way, he sends me Christmas cards. Um, my husband once worked on Good Morning America, they, and that rekindled. He said, I'm Kessler, the babysitter's husband. And he, what? <laughs> and that sort of started the dialogue again. Great guy. You did a project recently with, uh, for Les Paul, who recently passed. Tell me about that. Right after Les passed, Gibson Guitar um, put on a tribute concert to him. It was almost not a memorial, but just a celebration of his life at the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. And it had performers from every genre, jazz, rock and roll, anybody who played a Gibson, really, except me. Uh, but, you know, lots of, Winona Judd was there, and Steve Miller, who I believe it was Les Paul's. Godson. Yes. Godson, yes. Uh, all kinds of people. And what was interesting about my role in this was that they wanted me to do sort of a Natalie Cole, uh, Nat King Cole thing where I sang Somewhere Over the Rainbow to him playing it up on a big yes. screen. I was very hesitant because they, they, I didn't think it would work. And I said, I don't know what key he's playing it in. It may not be my key. He's playing lead guitar on this. How's a singer vocalist going to fit in? It worked. 
it all worked. And it was really cool. Now, you write your own music as well? I do, yeah. Okay. What, how's that experience? I love it. I started writing probably five years ago, and just a little bit. Put, uh, I had an album called You Are There Songs for My Father, where I decided, you know what? My father had just passed, and I said, the circle is complete if I write a song for my dad. Never done it before. Um, and I started that process, and it went really well. My musical peers seemed to be very happy with what I was doing. And then just one thing led to another. I just kept writing, and the last, the last album I did was all my own original compositions. And it was great. How do you get your work out there? Any way I can. <laughs> um, gigs, lots of gigs. Uh, I, I, and then when you record something, you have to be able to put it out into the world, get it distributed everywhere. It's a lot of hard work. I mean, it's so much work compared to the actual creative part of my work, you know? Now, I knew you were going to be performing in the South Orange Performing Center. So about that. Yes. Yeah. I was there, I believe, last spring, and it was great. It's in the loft space there, not the main theater. And, they, and it's really nice for a, 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 like a jazz band because they set it up kind of like a cabaret with tables, seats about 250 people. And um, I'm going to probably have my trio, maybe a horn. I'm not sure what I'm doing for it yet, but... Uh, it's a really great place to play. Now, Sarah, I know you performed on Good Morning America. That must have been a lot of fun. A blast. Uh, it just so happens that I'm one of Charlie Gibson's. This was uh, when Charlie was just about to leave there, one of his favorite singers. And my husband, ironically, also worked there. And that's how I met Charlie. I didn't get on because of my husband, because that would that's a big no-no. But Charlie said, I want to have her on. And they couldn't have been warmer and it was such great exposure for me you know it was uh, like breakout artist and uh, I just did one tune but it was really a thrill with it with the audience and the cameras and you know I've done a few other things like that but that's you know a big national show is a lot of fun but it was unique to have jazz on the forefront of a morning show right well and it was the fourth of July and there was a little bit of controversy about that I sang every day I have the blues people high up uh, in ABC said why is she gonna sing a blues on the fourth of July and I said you just wait the blues is a celebration, and I just thought it was the best song for the day. It's what came to, and it, and it was, and everybody had on their Fourth of July hats, and, and we had the celebratory blues, and it went over really well. It was a lot of fun. The jazz genre, how is it growing now? Slowly. It's, it's a tough genre. It's, it's small. It's, um, it's got very loyal fans, but, you know, unfortunately, this music is not the popular music of the day, and even though we are creating new jazz music. It's, I don't think it's, it's really, people aren't gravitating toward it the way they, I would like them to be. Kids need to know about this music. It's not really being taught enough in schools, you know? And I love educating kids on this music because when they hear it, they love it. They really, really do. It's different, it's complicated, it makes them think, and it can be really fun. So I'm a little concerned about the state of affairs, but always, always hopeful and will never give up. I know you have some projects coming up. We're going to take a break now. We come back. We want to talk about that. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back right after this. Nobody loves me. Nobody seems to care. Nobody loves me. And nobody seems to care. Speaking of bad luck and trouble.
Sarah, I understand you have a new project coming out. Tell me about that. Well, you're, you're going to be one of the first to hear about this. And I don't know if I should be talking about it yet, but I think I can, and I'll tell you why. First of all, I realize that I'm, I'm at my best when I have something to work towards, when I'm a goal-oriented person. And after working on my last album, where all my compositions were my own, I decided that the next one should be one where I salute a singer-songwriter who I have admired. And I was talking to my publicist who said, I think a tribute album would be great. People love tribute albums. Think of somebody you admire who may not be in jazz, may be in another genre. And I figured all my jazz heroes had been saluted many times over. And the person that came to mind was Janice Ian. Janice Ian, who 1976 won the Grammy for that song at 17. I learned the truth at 17, that love was meant for beauty queens. And I had loved her songs and thought that she was a little bit of an unsung hero. And Janice Ian has had an amazing career. I'll cut to the chase. So it was really interesting that during uh, the campaigning for Grammy Awards, we were in a group together and she popped up. Just as I had been thinking about, I want to do a salute to Janice Ian. And I messaged her on Facebook and said, I'm thinking about this. And she said, yay. Okay. A few months later, I get an email, just actually fairly recently, and she said, um, hey, if you're still thinking about doing an album of my songs, um, I have some suggestions. My heart lies in jazz. She had heard my work, and uh, we had sort of a mutual admiration thing going on. It led to many emails and a long conversation on the phone where she is completely behind this project. Uh, we're going to actually write and perform a, a song together on the album. I'm probably going to do at least one song that she's never, uh, that's never been published or recorded. And, and then I'm going to, you know, I'm going to cover her tunes and try to put it into my genre best I can while still being true to how she, to her writing. So it's exciting because she's actually going to be a part of this, you know, and I think it's going to be a really interesting kind of crossed genre album. I have no idea what it's going to be like, but I really feel like it's going to be great. What is she doing now? What, how has her career gone? She, you know, she's gone through mm -hmm. this. As all career. artists do, right? As, as all do, but artist. we're talking top of the top to bottom to back to the top. And I read her autobiography, and she says, you know, after 40 years of striving and going through this cycle, record, uh, uh, put an album out, work the album, do a concert, go back and write over and over and over, having no life, and then, you know, being had for all her money, so on and so forth. She finally said, I want to do it on my terms. I can make a living and be under the radar, and I can write songs, and I can perform. And she's, she's nominated for an audio book now called Patience and Sarah uh, for the Grammys. And she's doing everything that she ever did, but on her terms. As an artist who's actually made a career out of this, what advice do you give young people who want to get into theater, singing, the arts? I think. My, one of the things that I would say is something that many artists would say, and that is only do it if you have to do it. If you think, well, I don't know, or it might be fun, don't even bother pursuing it. You have to have this burning desire to be an artist. It is a very unusual lifestyle. It is, it is, you never know what's coming next. There's no set way of making a living. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. It's, it's a volatile uh, arena and very, very difficult. So I, I, hey, I encourage kids to go into entertainment, drama, uh, music, whatever, but you have to really want it. So now you're going to give us a sneak peek of what you're going to do in yeah, Jersey? Yeah, let's see. I'll be at Shanghai Jazz, um, and that's going to be, from what I, they gave me a call and they said, we kind of want to do a Sinatra thing coming off of his um, centennial. And so I'm going to be doing that, uh, an evening of, uh, a lot of Sinatra songs, have to go. that's easy to do. Real easy to do since he covered everything. I know you have a plan for 2016. What are some other things, places you'll be working? Uh, I'm gonna be, for the first time, going to Houston. Right outside of Houston, there's a performing arts center in Humble, Texas. I don't know, I've never heard of Humble, and it's a new performing arts center, and I'll be there doing a concert. I'll be going back to Washington and performing at, at Blues Alley. Um, I'll probably be heading out to L L.A and there's a club in Denver called Dazzle. Dazzle in Denver that I've done before that I love doing. 
Uh, and then Seattle, because my record label's out in Seattle and there's always a spring uh, jazz festival. And I'll do a little tour out there. Sarah, thank you so much for being on our show. My pleasure. And thank you for watching. We'll be back right after this. You planned a different way. The road had turned away. I never thought I'd be here looking in the mirror, wondering.